Good evening and welcome to the Explorers Club. I'm Ann Passer. Tonight's program is unique. We will hear from fellow members of the Explorers Club and friends of the Explorers Club who are devoting their lives, their time, their efforts in helping those in Ukraine who are suffering so greatly. As explorers, just about all our work depends on the communication and cooperation of others nationally and locally. We all need each other to survive. As you will find, there are ways for each of us to participate in helping those in need. Tonight, we're going straight to the front line with one of our fellow members from the Polish chapter, who's right now in Kharkiv, and his name is Tomasz Grybaczewski. So Tomasz, take it away. Following Tomas will be Mark Hannaford, who will be your host for this evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tomas Grzywaczewski, and I am journalist, writer, and documentary filmmaker from Poland. I'm also a member of Polish chapter of the Explorers Club. And um, right now I am in the city of Kharkiv in eastern Ukraine that is unfortunately still under shelling and I am placating this recording um, because when our meeting will start it's going to be a middle of night here and um, usually um, Russian forces are starting attacks during the night and if they do so the internet connection is probably going to be very weak or even switched off. So I cannot unfortunately promise you that I can that I will meet you with you live, but hopefully I will make it. Um, and um, I am I have been observing this conflict from the beginning of Russian full-scale invasion on, on February 24th. At that time I was with Ukrainian soldiers in the very first front line in Donbas. And the, the, the first thing that I would like to underline is that this war hasn't started in February 2022. It, it, has, but it has commenced in the year 2014 when Russia invaded Donbas. And since that time, there in Donbas, there have been trenches, abandoned villages, there have been people, also civilian people, um, killed. So the war has been going on for eight years already. And what we are observing right now is just an, another episode, extremely horrifying episode of this uh, invasion. And um, for the for the last weeks, um, I was I have been traveling all around uh, Ukraine. I was in the city of Dnipro. I was also in Odessa, this beautiful city. Uh, on the coast of, um, of the Dead Sea. I was also in Western Ukraine reporting about the fate of refugees um, fleeing um, from, um, from the regions torn apart by war, mainly to Poland, but not also to Poland, also to, uh, to the, the, the state of Moldova. Um, um, I was also very close to, to Kiev, um, the, the town of Vasilkov when I came there. Then um, the attack of Russian paratroopers started, and me and my colleagues, we uh, we found ourselves in the middle of the fight between Ukrainian army and para Russian paratroopers, which was, I could say, quite scary. But the thing what, that is the most important for me here is to report it of the fate of common people, civilian people that are the most affected by this by this um, this war uh, there are there, there are already millions of refugees from ukraine in europe <clears throat> however millions of ukraine stayed here in their homeland trying to striving to survive um, this um, this horrible russian uh, invasion and i would like to share with you today some stories from the city of Kharkiv. Um, that, 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 um, that um, was under shelling for, for weeks, the city center is demolished. Um, right now, um, the city center is quite, um, quite safe, um, even though just yesterday there was another attack. Um, but um, on the suburbs, there are fights, there, there are still um, fighting going on. And to the best of my knowledge, um, Russian forces are preparing for the, another offensive, trying to capture the city. Um, so we are also ready for that observing the, the situation and just um, and just yesterday and two days ago i was in the suburban neighborhoods 
inhabited by thousands of people, even hundreds, you know, even hundreds of thousands of people, because Chicago is quite a big city. Until the war started, in, in, it had been populated by about 1.7 million people. But right now, there in this in this district that are, that are under constant shelling, there are people living for weeks in the basements, very often deprived of electricity, deprived of gas, uh, sometimes deprived of um, uh, clear water. You know, they are cooking uh, on, on bonfires outside um, their, their houses that were demolished by Russian missile strikes, artillery, also by, um, by air strikes. Mm, and they are trying to survive there, what is not easy because, as, as I mentioned, almost each day there are, uh, there are shellings. Mm, yesterday, um, Russian, mm, Russian hit the district close, quite close to the city center. No one there expected that they are going to, to shoot in this place. People were outside in their, in their apartment because it was quite a sunny day and it was yesterday, it was Sunday. So people just wanted to, 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 to rest a bit outside their homes. And at that time when they were doing so, um, the, missiles, um, the missiles hit this district. Um, it was cluster munitions, which is extremely harmful, especially in the densely populated uh, regions. More than 30 people were injured. Uh, including three children, seven people were killed there. So they are in this hospital. I met the family, and uh, in this family, the, um, the uh, six year old boy was seriously injured, and his three year old year sister was also um, extremely seriously wounded. She is right now in coma in an emergency ward of um, hospital here. Uh, their mom was killed. Mm, the family mm, uh, was absolutely traumatized. They are even unable to, to talk uh, to uh, to talk to uh, anyone. And of course, such as stories are unfortunately currently quite common in, in all around Ukraine, particularly around uh, Kiev, but also here in Eastern Ukraine. Mm, this city was cut off um, from um, from other parts of the country for for weeks. It was impossible to get here. So also this is now it's the first time when big convoys of humanitarian aid are coming. And also yesterday I met a woman uh, that um, she's living in a basement in her, in her apartment was totally demolished. This lady, as I mentioned, is right now we're living underground in the basement because this district is still under shelling and she's suffering from breast cancer. And when the missile or elbow, I'm not sure, hit her apartment, she was smashed by the door and it caused um, that right now she's totally swollen also um, uh, like this this cancer is even bigger than it used to be and she's deprived of any medical care for already four weeks she's just staying underground she's afraid to um, to um, go about because of the of the bombardments and uh, i remember that like, she just told us that um, that uh, please do anything and don't let me die here in the basement. I don't want to die in the basement, not not seeing the daylight. And uh, the present moment, uh, we are trying to organize um, uh, a convoy to evacuate her to Poland and to provide her proper medical and also oncological treatment um, in, in in Poland. Hopefully we we'll manage to make it tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, because if Russia starts a new a new offensive, it might be too late to evacuate anyone uh, from from here. Um, so, so so this is one of the stories that you can you can that you can hear, can, that you can hear in 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 um, Kharkiv. Uh, I also observed, as I mentioned, people who are um, just going out from the people like oh, about 50 people living in the basement of school that was also um, partially destroyed. There is no electricity, it is very cold down there. And there are mo most of the, these people are elder ones. Some of them cannot, uh, cannot move, cannot walk. So they are just lying there for the past four weeks. 
Um, fortunately, recently they received um, some supplies of food so they can survive another day. But if new offensive starts, um, they are going to be uh, again on the on the front line and um, and people here need uh, particularly food. They need also medicines, they need medical equipment, bandages, um, medicines, I mean also antibiotics, anesthetics, uh, painkillers, um, first aid, first aid kit, uh, kits. So, um, so in, in fact, I think this Kharkiv is now right now one of the cities um, uh, where this humanitarian aid is really, really, um, really needed. Of course, even worse um, situation is in Donbas, in the city of Mariupol. But right now, Mariupol is encircled by Russian forces under the siege, so it is almost impossible to deliver there any um, any aid. But here in Kharkov, it is. So I also would like to say that um, if there is possibility to provide humanitarian aid for you to Ukraine, I think Kharkiv is one of the of one of the cities that should be um, one of the first place, places of, of choice for humanitarian aid and um, for humanitarian aid convoys and not only Kharkiv itself but also towns and, and villages in Kharkiv uh, region you know when Russians are preparing a new offensive in the southern part of, of Kharkiv region you know, there is evacuation going on there tomorrow I would like to 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 go to the villages that are, are right now evacuated by by Ukrainian authorities, because these villages are supposedly already under um, under under shelling. Uh, so um, I, I will not hesitate to say that what is going on right now in Ukraine is the, probably the biggest humanitarian crisis in Europe uh, since the end of the second uh, the Second World War. Thank you very much uh, for uh, your attention and. Um, it was a great, great honor to be here with you and to, to present to you my story. And if you are able to provide any help to Ukraine, I would be more than happy you know, to, to support you and also try to find you here, people that are responsible for receiving such an aid. Such an aid. Thank you very much. Amazing words from Thomas and shocking that those words are being said at this time when one assumed that we lived in a world that was boundaried by rules and sort of um concept of of normal behavior and politics my name is mark hennaford i'm um the founder of a, an organization called world extreme medicine also the the founder of an msc program at the university of exeter here in the uk the msc in extreme medicine and we're also an EC50 fellow from last year. And Thomas and I met um, previous to this call when we were talking about the preparation. And already we've started a collaboration in terms of bringing um, what we can do <clears throat> to bear to help him. And I think Anne puts that nicely that um, while this abhorrence and this uh, tyranny is happening in Europe, the way to, to fight this is to collectively join together um, and proactively help the people of Ukraine. Um, I've just returned from Ukraine myself, having run a small medical convoy. The, the aid agencies, to be quite honest, from what I could see, were doing an absolutely amazing job. But Ukraine is a big country and it's a, it's a country at war. The situation there is extremely dynamic and changeable. The situation is dangerous for, for people, for the people that are besieged, but also people who are going to give aid. Um, so there are there are gaps in the system and um the bit that um world extreme medicine and my team are, are focusing on and i think that's that's the, the thing is to focus on your speciality we train doctors paramedics nurses medical professionals to work in remote and and at times dangerous locations and clearly ukraine is one of those dangerous locations so our we've decided our mission is to deliver trauma supplies as close to the front line as we can possibly get them. And we ran our first convoy um, just a couple of days ago. In fact, I got back yesterday and we're running our next in a couple of weeks. We can't sit by and idly watch 
this is not some um some i, I don't know it isn't, it isn't some foreign land where it's it's you know this is relatable to our everyday lives this um this action is shouldn't go unchallenged or and 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 the ukraine people should not go unsupported and the responses from from what i can see has been amazing but we need to gather paces to my mind is not going to be a short term conflict even if it's not a short term conflict the recovery is going to take an awfully long time and so our response to it needs to be sustained and it needs to be uh, long term and we need to build that capacity to do that and i guess organizations like myself and what everybody else that's sitting here rely on um your support the the people watching us for your donations for your support um and during this session there will be a number of links for all of us coming up that will highlight ways in which you can help in you know us as a community of explorer the club members who were working to help the people of ukraine um and we've got a, an amazing sort of panel to present to you this evening talking about you know there are different efforts efforts in the in ukraine um i've actually run a convoy not dissimilar to this to syria with Soleil, who you'll hear from later on um and we ran once the last children's hospital in aleppo was bombed into extin extinction by the same fighters the same airplanes that are now bombing ukraine we ran a humanitarian convoy that rebuilt that pediatric hospital um and in some respects, it felt like we were operating in isolation there. There wasn't an awful lot of international response, if I'm completely honest. But it's heartening to see that we've learned the lesson from our response to Syria. And that's not a mistake that we're making with the Ukraine. The response, as I can see it, is, is, is worldwide. It's forthright. It has money behind it, has energy behind it. And it has people who are going to speak to you this evening, individuals who are taking action, not relying, relying just on the big agencies and, and governments, but actually taking themselves to the front line and to themselves into the Ukraine. So I'm, I'm not going to uh, talk about too much about what we're doing, except for the fact um, our fundraising title is Medics for UK, Ukraine. The more funds we can get in, the more that we can we can deliver to the front line. My company is underwriting all the operational costs. So everything you give goes directly into buying trauma kits. Um, we were amazed that we deliver kit to um, a, a location in Western Ukraine. And within 24 hours, that trauma kit was on the front line on the border um, with the with the antagonist. So that transference of kit actually was extremely kit, quick and we were you know, uh, I su pleasantly surprised, I have to say, by the, the logistics around moving supplies within Ukraine, given that the country is at war. So I kind of think that's enough for me, because I could prattle on for a very long time talking about um, what I'm passionate about. But we have a panel full of passionate people. And I'd like to hand on next to Piotr, who's going to introduce the remarkable Anna Reid. So Piotr, over to you. Yes, my, my name is Piotr Kwieniński, and uh, I was born in Rzeszów myself uh, in Poland, not too far from the Ukrainian border. I am friend of An Anna Reid, Dr. Anna Reid, and uh, her family. I was the first to paddle the entire length of Amazon River 85, 86. That's why I am in the Explorers Club. But today we have a bigger issue huge issue for all the explorers who are members of the Explorers Club. And as of today, about 2,500 million refugees from Ukraine are in Poland and no refugee camps are needed yet. That's the big, big deal. People of Poland and other neighboring countries open doors to homes and apartments and are treating Ukrainians as family members. This is incredible for everybody. My participation in helping in this terrible situation is limited, but through my family and with my friends from the Explorers Club, from my kayak club in Poland, we are trying to find shelters to as many refugees as possible in Poland. Additionally, friends from US are trying to do what is possible, and I would like to present one of the examples of the incredible involvement by Dr. Anna Reed. 
Anna Reed is a family friend. She was born in Poland in 1970s and with her parents emigrated as a refugee herself to US in 1984. Parents earned David college degrees in the States. Anna, after attending prestigious magnet Thomas Jefferson School, High School in Fairfax, Virginia, earned her bachelor's degree in the biophysics at the John Hopkins University. At the University of Virginia, she earned her medical degree and completed her pediatric residency at Northwestern's Children's Memorial Hospital. Additionally, she earned the master's degree in public health at the University of Maryland. She currently works at the United States Department of Health and Human Services. Immediately after the war started, when Russia invaded Ukraine on February 24th, Anna decided to help those who need the most, children of Ukraine. Not only did she go to Poland by herself, but also three physicians, friends joined her and traveled to Poland to work for almost a month in the medical centers helping children. Her husband, Dr. Robert Reed, started Help Ukrainian Refugee Fundraiser, and as of today, it provided almost 130,000 to the cause. This is my introduction to Anna. Now is a time for her to share with us her first hand on experiences from her help in Poland. Anna, thank you for joining us here. Anna, your speaker, your, your mic. Anna, your mic is off. Can you hear me? Now, yes. Okay, thank you. And thank you so much for that very kind introduction. Uh, and for, of course, allowing me and inviting me to participate on, on this panel. It is an honor to be here um, with all the other people. Uh, I'd like to start just by asking everyone who's watching to imagine that you're just eating dinner on the terrace of a lively city restaurant. Hot summer day, you're with your family, and all of a sudden, the entire city stops. And I mean, you can hear a pin drop. Um, the trams, cars, buses, they all stop in the middle of the road. And it feels kind of like the twilight zone. Um, and then suddenly everyone stands up and their heads are down. You don't know what's going on, but you can feel that the air is thick with tragedy. It feels like tragedy and it gets really hard to swallow. And for a full minute, it just feels like the world is completely standing still, barely breathing. And then it's over and everyone sits down and life resumes. Um, this is the annual commemoration of the Warsaw Uprising. Uh, most people uh, outside of historians or Poles themselves have not heard of it, um, although it was the single largest military effort taken by any uh, European resistance movement during World War II. Um, the people of Warsaw fought for two months against the Nazis and 60% of the children, women, elderly, and civilians were slaughtered. Um, the remaining quarter million were deported into concentration camps. And this was all done as a retaliation against the Varsavian's organization um, of the underground resistance against the occupation by the Nazis. And together with the units of a Nazi aligned Russians People Liberation Army and estimates are that 80 to 90 percent of the buildings in Warsaw were destroyed. Uh, after the conclusion of World War II, the ensuing decades in Poland were marked by Russian occupation, and they were very dark years of poverty and severely restricted freedom. Food was limited to keep the population subdued by hunger. Those who protested were arrested. Um, Arrest was a permanent condition. <laughs> uh, usually it was a disappearance synonymous with execution. Um, Poland was on the map of the world, but it was not free. I was born in the 1970s in that communist Poland um, with a puppet government of the Soviet Union. I grew up with my mother's stories of struggles, um, stories that she kept secret outside of our family, I think because she was embarrassed or ashamed. Um, she, she told me one particularly powerful story that has always stuck with me, how she was forced to beg for a single egg from a farm in the countryside. Just one egg, she told the farmer, for my little girl. 
and the farmer refused. He was too afraid of the repercussions uh, for his uh, own family because that small egg could have resulted in their death. Um, so no one could blame him, but that was the reality of the time. And while, mother, while my mother was ashamed of what she had to do, I couldn't have been more proud of her strength and determination. My father was a leader in a cell of the solidarity movement. Um, for those of you who are too young to remember, <laughs> um, the solidarity movement was a grassroots anti-communist political movement, which eventually led to the fall of communism in Poland and possibly the rest of the world. The communist police found out my father was involved, and so he was to be arrested uh, along with the other leaders of, of um, the cells. So my parents packed up one suitcase and fled Poland in the middle of a cold November night in 1981. And just a few weeks later, uh, martial law was declared in Poland. And later that night, we arrived at the Red Cross in Germany um, and stayed in the shelter, much like the ones that I saw all over Poland on my trip uh, that I returned from just a few days ago. And although I was very young and honestly have a somewhat limited memory of those days, my parents' stories are woven into the fabric of my self-identity. So on, 20, on fe February 24th um, of this year, when Russia attacked Ukraine, uh, never had I been more aware that Poland's past is in my blood. Um, I don't think any Pole was surprised by this attack. Uh, in fact, I think uh, Poland has been dreading it the wounds of the 1980s um, are still very recent and very raw. Um, so for me, there was only one natural course of action. Um, and as Piotr said, my very American husband, who is actually a descendant of settlers of the Old West, whose American roots trace back to the Mayflower, um, immediately went uh, to setting up a GoFundMe. And he worked tirelessly to put together the right team, um, put together suitcases and suitcases of medications and other supplies to make the journey even more powerful. And starting with the video sent to me by a friend who lives near the Poland-Ukraine border, actually in Jeshov Piotr, uh, where you were born, um, he showed me what was happening there. And that was basically sort of the nail in the coffin. And I saw the video and I, I really had to go. So I wanted to share that with you now. Anna, your mic is off. No, oh, she shared the video without. Okay, thank you.
Anna, you're uh, you're on mute. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Good. Okay. So what I what I saw in Poland was absolutely incredible. Incredible. It was just an outpouring of support um, that I really previously would have thought would have been impossible. And I think it was because we are uh, Poland is a historically traumatized nation, um, and the outpouring of support was to mothers, children, and elderly of a nation being traumatized. And half the time, I didn't know if I was crying from being overwhelmed by the magnanimity of the human spirit around me or, or by the crushing of it. Um, it's almost impossible to, to believe that never again, again has actually failed us. Um, it's almost impossible to believe that in 2022, there are streets littered with murdered babies and children and women and elderly, and that millions upon millions of families have been separated, possibly for um, author uh, Anne Applebaum recently wrote in an article for the Atlantic, there's no natural liberal world order. And unless democracies defend themselves, the forces of autocracy will destroy them. Now, in 22, not 50 or 80 or 100 years ago, now. Um, I wanted to show you one last thing. Um, there's some pictures you may not want to see. Um, some of these you may have seen um, on the news, like on um, CNN, or they've been on BBC. They're pretty disturbing. And so I saved them for the end in case there are some people who didn't want to see them. But um, I wanted to share them with you because one of the UK Ukrainian translators that worked closely with us um, shook the entire time she translated her voice, her body, but she had to help. Um, she's from this town outside of Kiev where the Russian soldiers frustrated by the fierce resistance decided um, to, to commit these atrocities. And I just wanted to share this one last thing with you. And I ask that you, you don't look away from this war um, uh, I know I will never look away from a war again. I know about my entire adult life, life there have been wars all around, all around me. Um, this is the first time I've been called to respond to a humanitarian crisis. Um, other tragedies in the world seem so far and unreal um, for me, and so I was able to look away, but I can't do that anymore. It's very uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable for me to look the other way. Um, so find a way to help. Don't look away. Thank you so much for letting me speak. Anna, thank you for your words, which are hugely impactful um, and show the, the depth of the disaster that has happened to Ukraine. Um, you know, for no, as far as I can see, no particularly good reason. It's just, you know, it's an abhorrence. Um, and like you i've been amazed by the reaction of the of the polish people it's just it's it, every door is open to the ukrainian people from what i could see i'm not from poland i don't know poland particularly well but i was amazed by the by the reaction and the support that, that they were give they're giving to people heading to the ukraine to give support but you're absolutely right this is not something that we can look away from we should look this full in the face and accept that we need to be as individuals collectively opposing and helping and, and supporting and not allowing this this for lack of a better word is evil to happen again so anna thank you for your for your presentation and your words um hand on next to martin now martin i i have to I have to say in my notes here i don't have an introduction to you so i'm going to have to ask you if you don't mind to introduce yourself um but the screen is yours Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, my, na my name is Marcin Jankowski. Um, I'm filmmaker and journalist based in Warsaw, Poland, and I'm vice chairman of um, the Explorers Club Polish chapter. Um, but I'm not going to speak about me. I would like to give you um, just a brief update of the refugees uh, situation here uh, in Poland. And um, let me share the screen with my um, little uh, presentation. 
Okay, um, so um, before Russia started the war in Ukraine this year, there had been uh, between 850,000 and 1.5 million Ukrainians living in Poland. And most of them were economic migrants uh, work, working mainly in construction business and uh, housekeeping, but also a significant part of this community were Ukrainian IT experts and also students learning at Polish universities. Uh, the community grew um, so much that in some cities there were even uh, first Ukrainian newspapers published. Uh, this is magazine Privet, uh, Privet, which means welcome in Ukrainian, and it was published in the city of Wrocław, which is um, close to uh, German border. Generally, Ukrainians in Poland were received very well. And part of the reason for this sympathy, I think it could be common history. Ukrainians and Poles had lived together for 500 years in one country, a so-called Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. And also uh, there is common enemy, and we know how well uh, it unifies. Both nations see Russia as a potential threat uh, to their uh, state independence. Uh, you can see here, it's a piece of art, it's knife sharpener with uh, Putin's face. And uh, when you sharpen the knife, you go on his throat. And uh, I think also um, Polish and Ukrainian languages are from the same language family of Slavic languages. So uh, part of it that we, so well now come together is that uh, even if we don't speak each other languages fluently, um, it is not so hard to understand each other. When uh, Russia started the war with Ukraine, approximately 4 million Ukrainians fled the country. And most of them went to Poland. Um, this is the map that I found from uh, that was a few days ago. Today I checked the numbers and new number is 2.5 million guests from Ukraine we have in Poland. And I say guests um, because this is how they are usually referred to. This is how they are usually treated in Poland by most of Polish people. Um, they are treated as guests. And I want to say that I, I, I really like this term very much. And um, to give you uh, the um, scale, um, how much is this, um, 2.5 million? Poland is a country of uh, 38 million inhabitants. So in one month, uh, by trains and cars and, and, on, 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 and just walking, uh, arrived to Poland in just one month, 6.5 um, population of, of Poland. We had 6.5 population rise in just one month. So try to imagine if, if it were in US, it would mean uh, 21 million people arriving in the country, to the country in March. Just try to imagine this amount of people um, at, the, at, the, um, at the border. So it's not a surprise that this number of guests came, to, uh, to, came as a surprise to the government, to the Polish government at the, at the very first moment. Also, Poland did not have clear um, refugees policy in the past and did not take part in the European mechanism for the refugees relocation. Um, so in fact, we were at the blink of the refugees crisis in Poland. Um, first, who answered, as Anna beautifully mentioned in, in her uh, very moving presentation were volunteers. And I mean, like dozens of thousands and, or hundreds of thousands of volunteers appeared at the railway stations and uh, they came to um, help Ukrainians um, with anything that they may need. Um, this is a friend of mine. Uh, here she went to the border and um, she was with people her helping with translation, organizing transportation to other towns and 
also offering accommodation in their private homes. And um, really, I mean, um, private homes, plenty of people um, were invited to Polish private houses and plenty of like um, of those 2.5 million uh, refugees, maybe half, maybe more than half, maybe three quarters of them found their um, places to sleep in the private houses. And um, we can call it like horizontal re relocation. Uh, I heard this term once. And um, I think this is why uh, we don't see too many pictures um, from Poland of refugees camps that we are so familiar with from, from the Middle East, for example. And this hospitality uh, that Poles uh, showed, that made me really proud of my people. It's, it's, it's really something. Um, even there were some volunteers who came to the railway station in Warsaw dressed as dinosaur just to cheer up some uh, children migrants. This creativity um, in, in Polish nation was, uh, is, is really big. It's, you know, even when you come down to such details, it's my local gym where I go rock climbing. Uh, they organized, for example, charity climbing competition uh, called Comps, not Bombs. And in one day uh, climbing marathon, we collected almost $10,000, uh, you know, just from the small rock climbing community in, in one city. Uh, that's the banner outside the gym. The slogan on the banner uh, says uh, Putin Idina Hui, which refers to the uh, Snake Island Defenders famous line. And it literally means uh, Putin, go fuck yourself. Pardon my French. Um, getting back to the big picture, finally, um, city councils first and local governments, they caught up with the situation and um, they started to organize local centers for redis redistributing, um, for example, some clothes and uh, pharmaceuticals and food, of course, too. And then... Um, country government followed soon with, um, with the nationwide strategy decisions. And among them, I think one of the most important was that every Ukrainian can get now Polish personal ID number. And uh, this is extremely important because it gives Ukrainians the right to legally stay in Poland. It clarifies their, uh, their situation. Also, it gives our guests free healthcare in the Polish public health system. And um, also it gives them open way for free public education. And it's been estimated that around 300,000 Ukrainian children already went to Polish schools. Uh, here on this picture, you can see these are stickers for uh, computer keyboards with um, alphabet that is used uh, in Ukraine. And um, also one of the, um, I think also important decisions of the government was that for hosts who uh, have Ukrainian guests in their homes, government is now giving financial support. It's not big, but it's, it's something. It's approximately $10 a day per person. Um, and um, last but not least, Ukrainians can travel for free uh, in all public transportation in Poland, including uh, long distant uh, trains in the country. Um, so it's um, looking pretty optimistic. Um, currently, we have some relocation centers. Uh, these are hubs in big cities that are for people in transit traveling farther west in Poland or to other European uh, states. And one of um, such centers in the um, uh, football stadium in Warsaw uh, was even visited uh, by President Joe Biden when he came to Poland uh, just uh, last week. And the USA announced on, on the occasion that uh, um, will accept up to 100,000 Ukrainian refugees. Um, Canada um, followed uh, too, um, even without setting uh, the upper uh, limit. 
Um, just one closing word about um, the future of this um, population of refugees in Poland. I think most of the Ukrainian guests will stay in Poland for some time. Um, yeah, at least for a while. Um, the language is close. They are familiar with their culture and also from Poland, it's, it, it, it's close to their homes. And um, depending on the dynamics of the war in their country, they may want one day to come back home or bring their relatives for the new home. And from Poland, it, it, it will be much easier. This is a picture from Facebook from my uh, local community. And it's, uh, it's, it's saying that group of Ukrainian women that arrived uh, to uh, the village near the place where I live, they are now preparing dumplings and um, some other uh, Ukrainian uh, food, and they are selling it. Um, and uh, uh, everybody is welcome to come and, uh, and buy it. And it's just one tiny example of small business and uh, how uh, Ukrainian guests are um, adapting in Poland. And I hope this adaptation, if they like to stay, will be uh, peaceful and uh, and really nice for for both sides. So I'm pretty optimistic about refugees' uh, fate here in Poland. Thank you very much uh, for your attention and um, um, yeah, thank you. Manchin, thank you very much for that <clears throat> really informative presentation on how Poland's responding to the refugee crisis. It's in stark contrast I would suggest to how um, we have responded to refugee crises in the recent past and, and Poland stands as a, a, a brilliant example of what we should be doing. Um, you can't replace the fact that these the, the Ukrainians are not in their own country but you can certainly make them feel as welcome as you possibly can and from the little bit that I've seen that's certainly the stance that Poland has taken as I came back over the border from Ukraine into Poland, I was amazed by the, 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 the reception, the positive reception that refugees were getting on the border. Um, you know, these people are lost, they're traumatized, they're displaced, but actually the warmth and humanity that was there to receive them was, was extraordinary. And I think Poland has shown the world really how to respond to these situations. And as I said, st stands in stark contrast to how some countries have responded to recent refugee crises. But anyway, thank you, Martin, very much for that, for that presentation. Um, I'm gonna hand on next to Sada, who I knew, know extremely well. I'm gonna read her, pres uh, her introduction because that saves me set, uh, get waffling on too long. But uh, Sada is um, a filmmaker and a broadcast journalist and emergency medicine doctor, formerly an, an army officer and also with a, a background in hum um, humanitarian law. You might want to correct me on that, that, that exact wording there, Sada. Um, she's studying for a PhD at the University of Cambridge, um, studying the impacts of, you know, the attacks against healthcare in armed um, conflicts, which sadly are becoming more and more common. She's also a member of the World History of Medicine faculty and the presenter at our annual conference. And as I mentioned before, at the beginning of this presentation, Sunny and I travelled to the uh, Syrian border a few years ago to deliver a paediatric sort of module to replace the bombed out hospital in Aleppo. Sala, over to you. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, thank you for the generous introduction. And um, it's been super humbling, actually, listening to uh, fellow presenters this evening, Anna, Thomas, uh, Marcin, hearing the real uh, frontline experiences um, that we really need to hear and need to keep hearing, frankly. Um, and, I, you know, I, I what, what it did for me was it invoked other episodes. Like Mark has said, we, we, we'd worked together in 2016 uh, on the convoy to Syria, um, the plights of refugees, definitely over the last 10 years is something that uh, we know all too well. Mark has generously allowed me to speak about um, the different places that I've been to over the last 10 years. Um, and I was at the annual conference that we have in November. And 
I just know that coming uh, in November 2022, we will again be speaking about yet another humanitarian crisis, another humanitarian plight, which will be Ukraine. Um, I'm quite unusually, I haven't actually been out to Ukraine uh, for this conflict. I was there in better times um, a few years ago because I'm also on the board for an NGO called Internews and we have a very strong uh, uh, chapter in Ukraine, I'm very proud of the work that they do there for uh, fr um, for free and uh, supporting free and open journalism. Um, but I have on this occasion, unlike the previous events of the last 10 years, I haven't gone out because I've, and it was really difficult not to actually, I didn't, I, I, I began to doubt who I was myself, um, but I, I felt that there was something more important that I could do from where I was. Um, and that's what this is all about. It's not about satisfying yourself. It's about responding to what the need is. So I'm just going to quickly um, try to share my screen. Um, and this is where it gets embarrassing because I might get it wrong. I want uh, to, ooh, uh, is, it, is it going to let me share? Um, Right, how do I do it? Why is it not sharing? I want to show you the presentation, uh, open system preferences. Is it going to let me? Oh, that is a shame. Oh, can you, you, you can't see that, can you yet? Nope, you just gotta click the green share screen button on the bottom of Zoom. Yeah, the I can't, horrible. yeah, I can't seem to find um, the, uh, the presentation. Where will it be? You have it's to open your presentation and have it open in the background. And then you want to click the green share screen yeah. button after you have your presentation already open. So on all the little white squares, it's not there. Yeah. So that means you don't have it open yet in the background. Oh, it's, it's on. Oh, damn. I might just have to just talk about it then. Why is it not you working? You can share your whole desktop and then open the window on your desktop and then just go full screen from your desktop. Yeah. For some reason, it's not doing it. I've done this a million times and it's just not doing it. Open. I am so sorry, everybody. I'm not quite sure why it's not doing it. I'll just have to talk about it instead. Okay. That that's is a yeah, I'll talk it right. I'll talk around it. Okay. So essentially, unfortunately, you can't see my presentation, but I will talk it through anyway. So the first picture I was going to show was basically about uh, the our time in Syria and there is an image there that you could mistake for being Ukraine because it's exactly the same it's a bombed out building it's actually a school and we made a panorama um, we, we were out there in 2013 making a panorama about the plight of children in conflict I feel that there are so many overlaps between what we have seen happening elsewhere that is happening now in Ukraine Sometimes the images that I'm seeing from Ukraine, from the horrific images of the streets, just take me back to Syria straight away. And also to Libya, where I was also, um, but more markedly Syria. And the reason why it takes me back to Syria is because it's the same aggressor. Uh, it's the same means of attack. It's from the sky and they're dropping bombs and they're hitting targets. And that's what has led me to where I am now. Um, deciding that making films, speaking about such things isn't enough. And that's why I'm doing this PhD now, trying to see if there's a way to influence policy and trying to improve um, respect for international humanitarian standards that exist and have historically existed, but are definitely not being respected. So the next picture that I was going to go to was what have I been doing instead whilst I've been here and not rushing out. Well, one of the things is getting the voices of Ukrainian colleagues. I'm a healthcare worker, I'm an emergency medicine doctor, getting their words out to an audience. And so I thought, well, what can I do? Who can I reach? So I decided to really focus on 
writing their words to the the most significant um, medical international <laughs> journal possible. So I asked The Lancet if I was able to write uh, a series based on Ukraine and they agreed. So for three weeks, I was busy in a very humbling process of speaking to Ukrainian colleagues who were being so brave um, to speak out, navigating internet connections, having you know all sorts of challenges, trying to get to a location where they could speak to me. So I could turn their words into an article and send them out. And I really, what I wanted to do was to tell you about some of these, some of these first-hand accounts. And it began first of all with you know a, an article that was about Ukrainian health workers responding to the war and how they were doing that. And in the very early stages, it was from um, an, a, an oncologist, a surgical oncologist in Kharkiv, who spoke of how even in that first week they were having to reconfigure their hospitals move it it was it was like deja vu everything that i'd heard from syria was happening in ukraine and this is before it was hitting the news about bombings of hospitals in ukraine i i kind of knew it would be happening anyway um and this was something that we needed to be all aware of and start speaking out about right from the word go to say no you know this has got to stop and the surgeon oncology, the oncologist surgeon from Kharkiv was talking about um, how he was redeploying to the emergency department to work uh, at the front of the hospital to treat the wounded and that they had discharged everyone that could be discharged, um, um, those that couldn't go home because it was too unsafe to travel, ended up staying in the hospital. Uh, staff had to stay for extended days in the hospital because it was too unsafe for them to go home and vice versa. It was too unsafe for the uh, replacing team to come on shift. Um, and they were moot, and he describes on one night in one of them, and the, the first piece that I wrote, how he spent his night, his night shift was spent moving patients uh, with everything that they needed to, to care for them into the basement seven times, a total of seven times in one night. And that was in the very first week of the attack. And that, that was Peter, who, who's was not his real name. Um, it was disguised, but extremely generous. The next one that I wrote about was about the plight of children who were caught up in Ukraine. And uh, they, and, and this was about um, the challenges in navigating healthcare for uh, children and, and what they needed. So what we had there was an account, a really harrowing account by a, a pediatric anaesthetist. And this time she was calling me from um, uh, uh, a, a, a place that is, uh, taken over by uh, the, the Russian forces, um, Kirsten, and it was talking about the challenges of getting uh, very, very sick neonatal children, babies, babies who had been born um, slightly early and who were needing respiratory support, um, trying to navigate them to get them to a neonatal intensive care unit and the challenges that they had. They didn't achieve it for this article, but fast forward by a week, when she came online, she was beaming, smiling, so happy they had finally achieved it. So for, from a, a week of doing telemedicine with P, uh, neo, neonatal uh, experts, intensive care doctors, they'd managed to keep the baby stable in their hospital. Then they had finally managed to navigate a 17 checkpoint trip a uh, return journey uh, from Kirsten to uh, the neonatal unit uh, to hand over the children, the babies, to a unit that could care for them definitively. It was incredible work, but 17 checkpoints. And they were cautious, and they had every right to be, because 
she described, Olga described, the doctor described that in the very first week, on the second day of the invasion, her team watched in horror. They were in the uh, HQ monitoring an ambulance that had gone out to pick up uh, an injured farmer who had driven onto a landmine um, in an agricultural area. They, the ambulance were desperately trying to reach him um, and they did reach him, but they had to then go down the street, dividing two fields, um, farming land, and there were tanks on both sides. And to their horror, to their horror, this ambulance that was clearly marked started to get shot at. And in disbelief, Olga sat in her HQ hearing from her paramedic that they were being shot at by tanks. Now that ambulance sadly was hit. Uh, instantly, the driver died, the patient died, the paramedic who made the call is currently uh, being looked after, severely burned, but being looked after by his colleagues. Now, this is what I have learned, um, uh, you know, by speaking to colleagues in inside Ukraine right now, that attacks against healthcare are happening, they're ongoing, we know they're happening, but they cannot happen with, Im with impunity as before. We've got to speak out. Um, very, very quickly, I know that I have been told I've got no time left, but I do want to tell you on the positive side what's happening. The Royal College of Emergency Medicine in the UK, together with the International Federation of Emergency Medicine, have done something that they've never done before. They have rallied with all the top emergency medicine colleges around the world, and they have written a very strong letter to the Lancet condemning attacks against healthcare, and say in Ukraine, saying that this has to stop and cannot go on without those responsible being made accountable, and it absolutely must stop. So I urge you please to do have a look at it, read it, because this is the kind of thing that, ha you know, we have to speak loudly in one voice against this. Uh, it's for all our sakes, but, you know, we cannot stand by and watch uh, healthcare um, and people and patients and healthcare workers be targeted like this um, so deliberately, so, so cruelly uh, in Ukraine right now. Um, I'm going to finish. Uh, I think that's Mark telling me that I have to stop. Um, but I, I'm going to, but I'm going to say one thing. I'm going to go back to Peter because I think this, this describes the Ukrainian indefatigable spirit that we all know. Peter, remember the oncologist, he said, I asked him, is he scared? And he invokes the memory of Fyodor Yuglov, a Russian surgeon of the Soviet Union and the author of Heart of the Surgeon, who operated on wounded soldiers during the siege of Leningrad. During an operation, a shell hit the hospital where he was working, removing an entire operating wall. What did he do? Peter said, he continued to operate to save a person's life risking his own. And that's the spirit that Peter and his colleagues are invoking and working to, and it's extremely humbling. And I'm sorry I went over time. <laughs> Sally, you always go over time, but it's always worthwhile. So thank you. Um, one of the things that Sally and I have been highlighting for the last um, for the last five or seven years is the increasing targeting of doctors, nurses, paramedics, medical facilities. Um, in conflict zones and the western world is not without some some blame too but it's certainly becoming um a policy of warfare to target healthcare professionals and we're and, and it's very evident in this particular conflict and it's something that needs to be highlighted um and to be addressed um maybe after the conflict but certainly to be watched to be monitored to be to be counted and those people who perpetrate those attacks to be held accountable Anyway, thank you, Sadia. Um, I'm handing over now, let me just start, just go to my notes very quickly, to Leveson Wood, who is um, presenting via video. Leveson Wood is a UK, um, in fact, let me bring his, his uh, bio up, so I introduce him, introduce him properly. So Leveson Wood is a world-renowned explorer, writer, and photographer, 
who's written nine best-selling books and produced several critically acclaimed documentaries which have aired around the globe. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce um, Leveson by his by, by video. Over to you, Explorers Club. There we go. Hi, my name is Levison Wood. Um, I'm an author and a photographer and um, just like to thank uh, all of the members and the staff at the Explorers Club for this opportunity to talk a little bit about my own experiences in Ukraine. Uh, thank you, Anne, who got in touch with me on social media. I think she'd seen uh, the fact that I was in Ukraine uh, last week and, and dropped me a line to ask if I would like to just give a few thoughts on the things that I saw. Um, my interest in Ukraine sort of stems back quite a way. I studied Russian history at university and I've traveled quite a lot uh, all across Eastern Europe, um, all across Ukraine, particularly in the North Caucasus, Georgia. So I've been watching this sort of, you know, the troop build up with interest since the, the back end of last year. And I, you know, also I used to be in the, in the British army as, a, as an officer in the parachute regiment. Um, so, you know, the, the, the current build up, what's going on, um, really ignited uh, a concern in me, particularly on, you know, on the humanitarian front, because um, as soon as uh, the invasion began, you know, this really had the hallmarks of, of creating an absolute humanitarian disaster. So um, it was uh, two weeks ago, um, a friend of mine, a guy called uh, Johnny, Johnny Mercer, he's a British member of parliament. He used to be a minister for veterans affairs. Um, we were sitting down and we were thinking, what can we do to really tell the story of the plight of the people who are being affected by this conflict? So we discussed the viability of doing some sort of an undercover fact finding trip to Kiev. Um, he'd been invited um, under the invitation by a Ukrainian member of parliament, but of course he couldn't tell our prime minister because there's absolutely no way uh, that he would get permission to go. So we went undercover. Um, basically, you know, th there are a few, quite a few security concerns traveling with, um, a, you know, a high profile politician, um, not least, of course, you know, the Russians do a very good um, electronic warfare capability. And we were very concerned that, you know, at times that um, they would able, you know, they, they might track us and, and he might become a target for kidnapping, you know, or worse. Um, but we thought it was worth the risk because this this was very much a story that needs to be told. So we went out there with with my director uh, to go and film uh, some of the things that were happening there for a for a uh, mini documentary that's actually coming out next uh, next week. So we travelled by um, we flew to Krakow in Poland and then took a, a train to the border and on to Lviv. Getting into Ukraine is actually the easy bit. Not many people going east, lots and lots of refugees, um, hundreds of thousands um, leaving uh, at any one time. But, uh, but going in, uh, it, I mean, it's fascinating. Going into a country, you know, Lviv itself is still a fully functioning city. Um, restaurants and things are still open, but it's noticeable that the, the conflict is happening because of things like the churches have been boarded up, all the big statues, um, have been covered in, in protective material, which is a testament really to the Ukrainians' love of, of history um, and, and art. Uh, but it's really when you get to Kyiv that you really see what the situation um, of, of a war is, of, you know, a city under siege is really like. Um, it, it feels really like, you know, you'd imagine that World War II, II cities to be under, lots of checkpoints, those tank traps, the kind that you see on, see on the beaches in Normandy, trenches everywhere. This is very much conventional warfare of the kind that, you know, I was training for when I was in the army 15 years ago. Uh, very different to the counterinsurgency campaigns that, that, you know, that I experienced in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, particularly, you know, when you're in a big city of 3 million people, huge city, uh, there's something very unnerving about listening to an air raid siren and the fear of um, of missiles coming down on your hotel. Um, but what was really fascinating was to see just um, the, the Ukrainian resolve against this invasion. You know, the fact that you've got the Ukrainian Defence Force merging with the Territorial Defence Force, all the village militias who've come together um to 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 unite really to to defend their country and everyone is, is working their very best to 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 fight um you know not just um, on the military side of things but on the humanitarian uh, response um but of course you know there are there are a lot of dangers in traveling around a country like that um you know when you've got a distribution of, of lots of arms across the country means that actually as a journalist traveling um, that there's just as much risk getting shot at by a twitchy fingered, um, a potentially poorly trained Ukrainian checkpoint as there is being sort of hit by a, 
uh, a Russian uh, mortar or, or missile, really. So you've got to really be very careful. Um, morale, though, I have to say morale is, is actually really, really high amongst the Ukrainian population, despite the fact that um, despite the fact that, you know, that it's a humanitarian disaster. A lot of the women and children have left. Men are not allowed to leave the country. Um, but there is this sense of unity. Um, you know, the, 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 the people are sort of making jokes to sort of, I guess, deal with the, um, deal with the invasion. The, the fact that, um, you know, the, when the Russian warship got um, sort of tried to attack the island at the very beginning of the campaign, and they, they got a very resounding response from the defenders and that, uh, you know, F off has become a national call to arms and you can literally see it on billboards all across the city. And, and all the people joke about the Ukrainian farmers having the third largest army in the world with all the tanks they've captured. And, and one man joke that the Russians are so bad at fighting that they spent three hours having a battle with a Soviet era tank statue that had lived on a roundabout for the last 40 years. So it is very impressive. Um, the country has been able to fight uh, to fend off the, the might of, of this um, a, you know, big army for so long. Um, and they've, you know, they've done this with with a combination of, of good humor and securing, um, you know, universally winning that that public opinion. Um, so it's really important that we that we, you know, do what we can to help assist um, the Ukrainian effort, particularly on the humanitarian front. There's some real issues facing the, the refugees um, that are trying to leave, you know, that when I was on the way out, there was huge backlogs of people trying to leave families are being split up there's actually a huge risk um, of human trafficking you know kids are getting lost kids kids are getting kidnapped um, and so it, it, it really is a humanitarian tragedy millions and millions of people um, have lost their homes don't know if their homes are even going to be there when or you know if and when this war finishes so um, for me just in terms of the biggest sort of takeaways really the game isn't over yet um, Putin might Putin might not have had the, the quick win that he wanted. In fact, you know, his army has been embarrassed, really, with with, um, with how poorly they have, have performed. You know, they've really been shown up for, um, you know, the hollow and corrupt vehicle of vanity that, that it is. Um, but they are still able to potentially win this, you know, just through sitting there and potentially, you know, a war of attrition. You know, the risk of encirclement is probably the greatest fear for the Ukrainians, particularly in Kyiv, if, if the Russian uh, army can cut off the supply lines from the West, um, then, then they can still succeed in their aims to install a puppet government and claim victory. Um, but we can only we can only really um, hope that, you know, one guy told me, he said, Putin's grave mistake was to send slaves to liberate already free men. And, and really, that says it all, you know, the freedom and security of Europe hangs in the balance uh, of the next few weeks. So I just really implore everybody to, to do what they can to, to assist, um, you know, what really is, is, the, is, is, is freedom and liberty in Europe right now, because it really does hang in the balance. Hopefully um, that was um, a, a sort of useful insight from my experiences, at least on the ground. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Leverson. And uh, I know this is by video, but I think Leverson's made uh, summed it up really nicely from a sort of geopolitical point of view. Next up on video, also we have Chris Nicola, who began his career as a cave explorer. Uh, and now has led two annual dozen caving expeditions throughout uh, the Ukraine in the last 30 years. And as a result of these trips, Chris has developed uh, a number of long lasting relationships with people in Ukraine. Um, this is a short recording from Chris in Israel to tell us as a community what he's been doing uh, to help the people of Ukraine. Over to you, Explorers Club. Hi, I'm Chris Nicola. And as many of you probably know in Explorers Club, I'm the caver guy in the club. And as you also probably know, I've spent a lot of time in Ukraine, especially over the past 30 years, running 25 uh, caving expeditions. And it was during the course of these expeditions I developed a lot of friendships, not only with the locals that I worked with, some of the guides, some of the vendors, as the drivers we hired, but also with a great number of foreign cavers that I brought in on the expeditions. Uh, so I have a family already put together of concerned individuals, but there's a third element that developed too. In um, the early 90s, I discovered a rumor of how some Jews lived in one of the cave, caves that I explored there and survived by for over 500 days. Well, it took another 10 years to do it, but eventually I found survivors and I started bringing them back and I developed a book 
and he also developed a documentary. Well, family members from the survivors came to Ukraine too, and they became friends with the cavers I was bringing from the US and other countries and also with the locals. So I have three different groups now and I'm addressing all the concerns. They're all concerned about their friends in Ukraine. And uh, I've been assisting them in not only locating some of their friends who they specifically want to find and maybe even help bring out. In one case, for example, the granddaughter of one of the people I wrote about in the book, Secret of Priest Grotto, uh, when we were filming in 2010, Erin is her name, she met some family members um, that hid her grandfather from the Nazis during the Second World War. So quite recently, Evan said, Chris, is there any way you can find out what happened to so-and-so? And, -so? and I, I worked on it. I, I had people on the ground over there I could connect. It wasn't easy, especially during uh, the fighting. But we located her, uh, the particular woman. She's not in good shape medically, but now we're trying to figure out some way to get her out of the country. And there are other people that are looking for relatives that they lost touch with, and I'm assisting them. Or the people that have successfully gone out of Ukraine, I'm through the caving community, I'm finding them places to stay, and I'm also finding them employment. And in some cases, even educational opportunities. And I should mention, it's not just Ukrainians looking to get out of that area. I have Russians that are trying to get out too. And uh, there's an interesting thing that occurs in caving, and I think it's an exploration in general. We have a saying in, in speleology. In the world of speleology, it's one world underground. We're all united in our exploration of nature. So there are Russians that I'm helping too. And many of them work hand in hand with the Ukrainians that I'm talking about too. For every Ukrainian I know, they have a Russian relative. And for every Russian I know, they have a Ukrainian relative. Anyway, that's just some of the things I've been doing to assist our friends in Ukraine. And uh, I want to thank my fellow Explorers Club members for all the humanitarian aid and effort and relief that you've been giving to our friends in, in Ukraine. And I should mention, I have a tremendous resource here in New York City, especially. There's an area called Little Odessa. It's Coney Island, Brighton Beach area. Uh, any uh, Jewish uh, uh, Ukrainian or Russian Ukrainian, I'm sorry, Russian uh, <laughs> Jewish person in America, that's over 50 will know about Little Odessa because many of them immigrated uh, to the United States here. So there's plenty of assistance for Ukrainians, you know, by the Russians there and by the Ukrainians. And I tap into that resource all the time, especially in trying to find lodging and employment for different people. And thanks again. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate to those of you in the audience, we are running massively over schedule, but given that this is a pivotal moment in history and everybody's story is so personal i think it's worth um using this time to to explore the topic um but i would like to hand on next to marcelo garcia from the uh, explorers club chapter in um excuse me in switzerland marcelo over to you thanks mark and very happy to be here to share some experiences and um, talk about the work that we've been doing uh, so far and um, I think that for context, uh, it's worth mentioning that uh, I was born in Brazil and I grew up there. And uh, I learned quite late in life that there are close to 1 million Ukrainian descendants in Brazil. Right? So because the society is so well integrated, you don't really know much about that. But the community there is absolutely massive. And on a, a personal note, I have uh, lived in Kiev uh, for a few months. I've been to Odessa, to Lviv, to Kharkiv, to Crimea. Uh, so I feel very... Uh, attached to the country, to the people, I have many friends. So as soon as I heard that invasion uh, had started, it was a few days before the largest uh, telecommunications conference in the world, the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona, and I was going there. Right? So um, uh, in, in the uh, few days before the event, I started thinking, what can I do that could have long-term impact uh, that can be done remotely? And uh, it came to my mind, uh, this book over here, which is called how to avoid being killed in a war zone. And it was written by Rosie Garthwaite, who's now a producer with BBC. I got in touch with her uh, because I was also involved in the Syrian crisis. 
I uh, can share um, uh, some materials about the work that I did there. I ended up being at TEDx about uh, bringing connectivity to refugee camps. And um, because we already connected, it was very easy for me to reach out to her saying, uh, what about uh, doing a version of your book in Ukrainian? Is that something that you like to support? And of course, she was 100% supportive, got in touch with the publishers, and I have the formal authorization from the publishers to translate up to half of the book into Ukrainian for free. And we're working uh, the whole supply chain and how to get uh, not only a PDF version, which can be legally distributed in a country, uh, giving them skills that they probably haven't uh, had a reason uh, to learn so far, I uh, hope they uh, never have a need to use it in the future, but it's always good to have those skills. And we also try to get the nations to print a booklet, so a pocketbook format that each family can then have and keep as a reference. So this is the very first thing that uh, I started doing. Uh, during the conference, I tried to meet all the companies related to telecommunications, and that's the background of my family as well. I've been doing you know, this since... My grandfather was a telegraph operator in the 1920s with the Brazilian Navy. So um, I was looking for people who were in the same uh, frequency, no pun intended, uh, to uh, help out uh, with the Ukrainian crisis. And I managed to find uh, a series of companies that uh, do have the emergency telecommunications knowledge, one of them called uh, Airspan, uh, which is based in the US, so listed in New York Stock Exchange, and I was fortunate to meet one of the founders who was very, very supportive. So the solution that was developed by them for remote customers, oil platforms, and all sorts of places where you need to have a Wi-Fi using a satellite backbone, they are really perfect for the situation of in Ukraine, in which the telecommunications infrastructure is being destroyed because that's a strategy of war. And you want to make sure that there is a rapid response, especially in the case of hospitals, that if they lose the connectivity, they are able to use the Starlink terminals that Elon Musk has donated. And he did donate thousands of them. So this equipment is already uh, available in warehouse in Poland. But um, they have a very limited range. It's a Wi-Fi repeater, you know, 50 to 100 meters. So the solution is trying to bring in a short diagram a little bit later is uh, capable of extending that to up to three kilometers. Right? So we're trying to make sure that uh, the hospitals are connected, but then all the other emergency services, the territorial defense people, the schools and the place where the refugees are going uh, to uh, a sick shelter, they are connected so that people can stay in touch and you avoid lots of the problems that have been described by the previous speakers uh, so far. So we managed to raise initially uh, around 20,000 euros that went into buying uh, satellite phones uh, for the different ministries so that they can uh, communicate on a go without being targeted, which is also something that was mentioned by Levinson. Um, no, if you use a mobile phone, you can be tracked and it could be attacked. So the satellite phones uh, have been delivered. We're trying to find more. And um, there is another device I'd like to show here. This is from Garmin. It's called InReach. And it allows you to connect to another satellite network, which is called Iridium. And um, I was mentioning that to Kevin, uh, who's going to be introduced by Mark after I, I finished talking. And um, I told him that I thought it would be a very good idea because it allows you to use a mobile phone that is basically powered up, but has no connectivity. And a talk to the device, which then communicates and sends messages via the satellite network. And this is really important because if you're a hospital in Kharkiv and you lost all links to the internet and there is absolutely no cell coverage, there is no way to tell people they run out of supplies. And these devices allow you to do that. So Kevin has managed by himself to find donors for 500 units and they've been given to the ambulances and hospitals. I'm trying to find another thousand. So I'm reaching out to companies such as Garmin and the others in the supply chain uh, to facilitate, to maybe waive the subscription fees and everything else that uh, they can do to help us out. And um, Another project uh, that is also related to communications is uh, wind up radios. Right? So basically, uh, if you lose the power, you want to understand what's going on. And this is something that uh, happened in cities that have been occupied like Kherson and oh, currently under attack, uh, such as Mariupol. Uh, you want to make sure that people, at least clusters of people, families, they have the ability to just wind up a radio that uh, can also be used to charge your mobile phone and listen to the news, assuming that the frequencies are not being jammed. And we also try to find um, some uh, donors to help us out with that. So, so far we raised around 70,000. I'm trying to structure uh, the uh, 
uh, options in terms of do you want to buy booklets that would help them survive in a war zone or this kind of knowledge? Do you want to help with the satellite communications? Do you want to help with the wind up radios? So I give you some options, but they all related to telecommunications in general. And uh, very briefly, just uh, share the screen as we discussed before, because I know we were super late. So these are the uh, items that I mentioned before. So can you see? Oh, a list with three devices there because I cannot see it myself. You're all good, Marcel. Yeah. So basically, these are the uh, three projects. Uh, the translation of the book. If people want to help with donations, we'll be able to print more of them. And we do have the distribution into the country. Uh, you have the wind up radio. So now you have the image of what they look like. And uh, also those uh, in reach devices that allow you to send messages via the satellite network. And uh, I would very briefly share and then i'll uh, wrap up the uh, relatively complex image of uh, how we're trying to expand the starlink terminal capacity so these are the network diagrams that uh, allow you to just plug a master radio device into the starlink you keep the wi-fi range of the starlink terminal itself but you can then uh, reach out with the wi-fi extenders that are professional grade and ruggedized so that they work outdoors as well that allow you to point let's say the starlink is in a hospital you'd be able to point into a school that is three kilometers away and they are going to have a little wi-fi bubble also covering 100 meters and you guess to figure out where you want to have those extenders and the whole system is plug and play so it's a very advanced and has been designed for this kind of situations so i don't want to get into the details of the, the whole solution here, but to anyone who would like to help with telecommunications or if you're including the books, communications in general, right? It's just sharing knowledge uh, with people. I'll be very happy to discuss the details and, and thank you so much uh, for your time to listening and uh, back to Mark to introduce Mark. Marcelo, thank you very much. And thank you for your appreciation that we massively overrun. But communications is clearly a critical part of the solution to the humanitarian situation. And can I just ask one question in terms of we were certainly being um, operational secure in terms of having all our phones switched off whilst we we're in the Ukraine. A satellite phone isn't able to be tracked and identified as being um, non-Russian? It's much, much harder. And that's why the US gave uh, President Zelensky uh, one of the iridium phones. So okay. there are four uh, satellite phone networks. You have Turai, you have Inmarsat and Globestar. But iridium is the one that is considered to be the hardest to crack. And this is why we're giving them to the ministers so that they can move around without being targeted. Perfect. Thank you for that. I just I wasn't quite sure why that was that was the case, but thank you for clarifying that, Marcel, and, and thank you for your uh, keeping the time management there. And uh, Kevin is now Mark. Mark, I haven't got notes on who you are to introduce you, but you, you look like a person that is more than happy to introduce themselves yourselves. Um, over to you. Hi. Uh, yeah, I'm Mark Miller, um, and this is a last minute edition. Uh, you know, I talked to Ann and saw that this was happening, and knew that we had to get my uh, my friend and colleagues. Uh, story out, Kevin Rourke. Um, so I'm basically just Kevin's uh, surrogate. Uh, he wanted to call in, but the last time I texted uh, him a, a couple hours ago, he was on a bombed out road in northern Ukraine um, and with poor connectivity. So I'm kind of taking over. He wrote a little letter. Uh, so I'll give him a, uh, Kevin a quick intro uh, and then read his letter and uh, I'll make quick work of it. Um, so Kevin Rourke, Explor Explorers Club member since 2020. Uh, he was prior Army Special Forces and was uh, instrumental in getting um, evacuating thousands, thousands of people from Afghanistan last summer. Um, when he's not out saving uh, thousands of lives from war zones, uh, he can often be found conducting ocean sciences in remote parts of the uh, world on his sailboat. And he uh, now also works with me at Greenwater Marine Sciences Offshore as director of special projects. Um, uh, so Kevin's story here is uh, again, quite impressive and worth the, uh, the extra weight. Um, here's Kevin. It is a pleasure to be uh, able to raise awareness for the current efforts on the ground in Ukraine. I've been on the ground in Ukraine and all surrounding countries conducting surveys well before the invasion kicked off in February 24th. Based on my observations, the invasion was likely to happen in the coming weeks, so I decided to head over and see if I can establish a humanitarian assistance infrastructure that could already be in place if the war kicked off. After I established, I was established in the region, 
I was then asked to lead the effort of a nonprofit called Save Our Ally Allies as their ground force commander. To date, I've been able to raise over $2 million through Save Our Allies in order to enable infrastructure procure procurement uh, and execution of medical outreach programs, humanitarian assistance distribution and evacuation to those that can't evacuate on their own. I was able to secure logistic lines, including several trucking companies, warehouses, inflatable boats, a fleet of ambulances and all train vehicles. In addition, uh, these are items acquired through donation, uh, the 500 Garmin inReach satellite communications uh, devices that Marcelo was talking about, 100 GoTo antenna, um, uh, GoTenna, sorry, uh, encrypted closed loop mesh systems. Don't ask me to describe what that is. 30 high frequency radio base stations, 30 Iridium satellite phones distributed to hospitals, chaplains, and truck drivers, 50 Goal Zero generators with solar panels distributed to churches that are housing displaced persons. He has four uh, all wheel drive vans that have been given to churches, uh, churches in Poltava and Kharkiv to shuttle food into Kharkiv and people out. Uh, I have supplied two hospitals in Kiev and one children's hospital in Kharkiv with $100,000 worth of medical supplies after they completely ran out. And I've delivered 21,000 tons of food and humanitarian supplies to towns that have been cut off by the most conventional supply lines. Another line of effort that I've been executing is precision evacuations of those who cannot move on their own. With limited resources and manning, I have prioritized the elderly and children left behind in active combat zones around Ukraine. I have conducted over 16 evacuation operations into contested areas, including the rescue of Ben Hall, the Fox News reporter. Uh, currently, the need is more resources in the form of financial donations, donations of communications equipment, medical supplies, body armor, and personal protective equipment. Um, so that's the message from Kevin, saveourallies.org. Uh, let me give you a couple pictures of uh, what he's been doing here. Did that fill the screen? Nope, not yet. How about that? So there's that Kevin. With, working. There we go. So uh, one of Kevin's early trips, uh, a couple of uh, elderly ladies that couldn't get out of Kiev uh, on their own. So he went in and picked them up. I think that might have been one of his first runs uh, and then loaded up the van with uh, a bunch of kids. He usually ends up getting going to the orphanages and, and pulling out many, many uh, kill, uh, children. Uh, and here's Kevin uh, loading up um, Ben Hall after uh, he got him out of the country. This is in, in Poland. And there's many more, but I won't share too many of them. There's, uh, there's the first hospital that was uh, hit by a missile. Um, there, that's all I got for uh, him. There's also a link for Save Our Allies uh, in the chat room and a video of the uh, Fox News report. Um, you can guess they, they talk about Kevin, but under a different name, you'll figure it out when you watch the video. That's all I have, thank you very much. Thank you, Mark, for, for standing in so eloquently and so um, so well. Um, we have massively, to the audience, we have massively overrun. And for, for some of us, um, not myself, but for some of us, it's three o'clock in the morning. For me, it's two o'clock in the morning, the same for Salia. So we're gonna keep the question. In fact, we're gonna kind of agglomerate uh, a question. There is a question from that, um, people have asked about how they can help aside from direct donations and money. And I think that's a difficult question because actually the solution is buying tailored solution, buying tailored supplies, buying supplies that are needed in country. So it's, it's, let me put that to the audience in terms of how can people help when it's not a direct donation or it's money. And I think the, the explorers cover putting all our links for our various, um, activities in the chat so that people can donate should they wish and we would you know be all very grateful for any donations but how can people help that isn't a monetary or a direct donation Anna you look like you're, you're poised to give an answer 
I'm not poised. I just, you know, <laughs> but I can give an answer based on the fact that when I went to Poland, there were people all around me who had just, just arrived and they, fr from everywhere, everywhere in the world, um, literally packed up a bag and said, uh, you look like you speak English because your jacket is in English. Do you speak English? I'm here. What can I do? Um, and one of the pictures I showed in my slideshow was a man that showed up from uh, North Carolina. Um, and he literally said to me, hi, I'm Will. I have $50,000 in my pocket that we rent, we raised through a fundraiser. What do you guys need here at the Red Cross? Do you guys need more beds? What do you need? Um, so you're right. I mean, I, I understand where people are coming from and that's part of the reason why we started a fundraiser, why my husband started a fundraiser, because it's so hard to know how much overhead is, is part of the money that you're donating. Right. And what you want is all that money to go to the cause that you're, that you're choosing. Um, so it, it's a it's a very difficult question. I would say um, I agree with you that the funds are the best because, for example, you guys have way more experience in, than I do. But even in my very limited time there, um, I made so many contacts, and so now I'm in contact with people who are going either back and forth into Ukraine or to the border, and they're telling me I need more tourniquets or I need blue tape to go on the soldiers, um, you know. Um, uh, uniforms because the Russian army is dressing up like the Ukrainian army. And so it's, we don't know who's who. I mean, so, so, the, so I just buy what I'm told um, with the GoFundMe money, but that's because I have someone who's telling me what they need. And then I send it to their home address. <laughs> um, so if it, it's very hard to, uh, to establish that kind of relationship, I think, without having a direct connection. Um, so unless you're willing to go, I think, um, and directly help or f fundraising on your own is, is, is difficult. And also I feel like maybe diluting what we could do bigger as a group, like for instance, what Kevin is doing, um, you know, he's, he, it sounds like he's made such incredible, uh, meaningful, um, strides, um, with, with all the money he's been able to put together. So, um, I don't know. I mean, I'm planning to donate to, to Kevin's cause now for my GoFundMe because I feel like it's going to have greater impact, you know, um, and having heard you speak, I, I definitely, uh, trust where that money is going to go. Um, so I, I think the only way for you to get to trusting that your money's going to get somewhere is you either trust the source that you're giving it to, or you go yourself and you make your own contacts, which is not ideal for most people. Um, I don't really have Thank a Thank um, Salvia, your thoughts? Yeah, so um, I, I'm going to tag onto that. I'm gutted that I couldn't um, share my screen because what I was going to show you were pictures of um, what the what we've been doing in, in the UK with our Medics for Ukraine initiative. And again, this comes with wanting to connect directly as healthcare workers here with healthcare workers in Ukraine. And it, because it, it, it offers, yes, it offers some material um, uh, support, but it also offers a connection, a solidarity, you're not alone, you know, you can reach out and, you, you know, we can support you in so many other ways, whether it's just to offload, to ask a question on a, on a particular clinical situation, all, all those things are applicable. So in, in terms of, um, you know, what we're doing, we are trying to connect directly with medics, so medics to medics, and we and Mark, as Mark said, he has has just come back from a trip um, delivering uh, essential medical equipment that is, and we're getting the photographs through um, from where it is going, and it's arriving just in the nick of time 
to clinicians who are needing it. And it's that's been super, super um, rewarding and inspiring and motivating. And then we're continuing to do that. And what I was going to share was the image of the, uh, I'll still try it, but it's not, I don't think it's working, um, of, of the, um, of, of the medics for uh, for Ukraine page, it will be it will be uh, somewhere I think at the end, won't it, Mark? But please, you know, do consider that as well. Um, another way is, as I said, is advocacy. You know, there are certain things that I I haven't gone out yet because there were these pressing things to do. Um, I really needed to go off, you know, and needed to get those things written and out because it helps create um, uh, sort of a conversation and a dialogue. And it meant so much for those doctors to feel that their words were being read by other clinicians around the world in this really prominent article. And that that meant a lot to them. So that's what was important. Um, so advocacy is pretty important. The other thing that we've been doing is... Um, Again, it goes back. It's like what Anna said. It, what do they need? What exactly do they need? Don't sort of imagine it on yourself. What do they need? Um, and they needed training very, very, very early on. One of the first things that um, um, a doctor was telling me from Kiev was, we need to know how to manage these mass casualty situations. We've never had to do that before. Why would they? And so what we've been doing here in the UK is creating films training films we've just gone through the whole syllabus of what we do and we've started to tick off all these films we're creating them um they're in the edit right now they will be uploaded um again it's knowing as a clinician what you sometimes need to look up quickly if something comes in that you're not sure with so we're we're tailor making it to that but you know if you can if you can find a way to support um any of these you know, information that's going on tonight, that, you know, that would be amazing. Personally, um, I thought the, the comms was incredible because that's such a, that is so, so challenging when that goes down within a hospital. Sorry, I've gone on long enough, but yeah, medics for Ukraine, if you feel that way inclined. Imagine from your perspective, um, from a humanitarian and refugee point of view in Poland, which has been a, proved itself to be a remarkable host, what would you say in closing would be your, you know, how can people help, um, even help Poland support its Ukrainian, new Ukrainian population? Well, I think um, like here, the best um, thing that you can do to help is just to go and be the volunteer. A lot of people in Poland, they speak Russian language because uh, the older generation had Russian language at school. And a lot of Ukrainians, they also speak uh, Russian language, usually as the second language. So there is some good mean of communication and some people can volunteer and help with uh, communicating and can help with many uh, just things that are in need here uh, on the ground. And uh, if you are thinking about donating some money, um, apart from uh, the organizations that were mentioned before, I heard about one very interesting initiative that people go online and they go to um, Airbnb and they book rooms in Ukraine in uh, the, the, the regions that were mostly struck by, uh, by the war, uh, uh, damaged during, uh, during the uh, battles, and they, they book and they pay money for, uh, uh, for, for booking the places uh, which they would never uh, uh, visit, most probably, or at least not in the near future. And this is the way that they can donate some money to the people that are really in need on the ground in, uh, in Ukraine. So, you know, just maybe this crazy idea could help someone too. And I think it goes back to the, the uh, you know, the ways in which we help are only limited by our imagination. And the more imaginative we are, the, the the more that we can help. You know, I want to thank the audience for this has been a long session. This is my first time I've hosted an Explorers Club session. And I think running over by the by the amount that we have is probably a record, which I'm quite proud. This is a pivotal moment of history and it's worth having everybody's views here because there are so many different views and the way that people are engaging and in, in helping Ukraine 
um, and the abhorrence of this invasion. So thank you as an audience, if you've been here for the whole session, thank you very much for your stamina. Thank you all of you as the panelists for your contributions in the so many different and varied ways in which you're helping and the different outlooks that you're bringing to, to providing that solution. And thank you to the Explorers Club for giving me the opportunity to host, although time poorly, my first session. So it's, uh, I guess, good night from, from all of us. And um, we look forward to seeing you at the next Explorers session or at the ECAN dinner, indeed. Thank you very much. <laughs>